Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chris Morrow. I'm a Senior Product Manager of Technical Products with Amazon Alexa. I've been at Amazon for about four years and I have shipped consumer-facing products in both Alexa Entertainment as well as Alexa Shopping, where I currently am running the all of Alexa's book-related uh, shopping capabilities, as well as uh, things like if you ask, ask Alexa to read a book, or if you ask Alexa to recommend you a book, those are all uh, part of the product portfolio that I manage, which is why I'm really excited to be here today to talk about the power of the prototype, which is something that has helped me as I've gone through my career thus far in product management. Let's kick things off. Uh, but checking in with our agenda. So introduction, great news is that that's already complete. Next, we're gonna move into a little bit of context setting and then jump into three different types of uh, prototype techniques that I've used in presenting different types of products across my career. And then we'll, we'll end with uh, a couple of takeaways. All right, so some context setting. I learn best through application. And so the focus of my talk is gonna be on uh, applications and, and less on theories. And the output of this is going to give you a couple of ideas to try the next time that you happen to be in this particular phase of product development. I will, uh, full disclosure is that my talk is not mutually exclusive nor collectively exhaustive. So do not tell my business school. There are many different frameworks that you can use to, uh, for prototyping. There are many different times that you can use prototyping from the very start of the product development cycle all the way through you know, software development, shipping, and then iteration post-launch. The purpose of this talk is not to catalog all available pay, uh, prototyping uh, methodologies. It's just to tell you my experience using prototypes, which uh, is reflected here in Merriam-Webster's di dictionary definition, actually doesn't help us at all here. It's a uh, first full scale and usually functional form of a new type. No, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're gonna talk about today is prototypes as part of the uh, introductory phase. So that, that phase when us as product managers are out there trying to communicate this idea to uh, stakeholders, we're trying to add uh, evidence or weight to our hypothesis uh, of customer value, and we're just trying to, uh, or, or, or we're trying to prove product market fit. It's prototyping in those, you know, these the first two phases during product development and uh, introduction. And my experience so far um, is with prototypes is that it using a prototype helps others understand the vision. It doesn't matter how well I am able to speak about a concept uh, or write about a concept, a stakeholder actually seeing the concept helps them understand in a way that talking about it, I've noticed, doesn't. The other thing that it helps you do is, uh, or it has helped me do is identify hero use cases and P0 features, which you know, at the beginning of product development, especially as we're, you know, it, at least for me, as I'm you know, writing a, uh, at Amazon, the, the, the PRFAQ, uh, which is how we, we fund projects. That's what every, you know, every product starts with. As I'm you know, writing through that, the specificity of what is what is the MLP look like? What are the features that that go into that? What are what does the customer absolutely have to have? And what does that that customer journey look like? You know, prototypes are a great way to drive to specificity with some of those uh, some of the uh, to some of those very questions. And then uh, finally, it adds confidence to, to product market fit. It can help me gather information and it has, has helped me gather both quantitative and qualitative information uh, to help add uh, data to the hypothesis of whatever customer value opportunity I've discovered. Um, so <laughs> the three approaches that I uh, have used, I've uh, sort of, there's the paper prototype, which I think is uh, Fairly straightforward. Turns out that if you um, do an internet search for paper prototype, there are plenty of both uh, design and uh, product management uh, websites that 
have assets for paper prototyping. We're going to talk about some really low fidelity stuff that I did. Uh, then we're going to talk about the hackathon special, uh, which is one, one of my favorite things uh, to do. Uh, very low fidelity as well. And then we're going to talk about the video supercut, which uh, also can be either can be scrappy or spendy, depending on your budget and most importantly, the risk level of what you are trying to prove. So let's go back to 2018 and let's talk about uh, choose your own adventure. So as a uh, fresh product manager, I had I just started and the scope of my responsibility was to uh, ship the first three Choose Your Own Adventure books, starting with The Abominable Snowman and turn those into interactive uh, audio experiences on Alexa. We were partnered with Audible, so we had full access to their uh, number of very talented narrators. And we were going to take the, that audio, have take that narration, turn it into something you could interact with uh, with your voice, which was all well and good. Um, but when you get into the specifics of, well, what does that pattern look like? Well, you know, sure, the narrator will, you know, read through a segment of the book. In fact, so how do we take this and turn it into something that goes on a device? If we look at here on the book, there's no prompt that says, aside from something that says, turn to page 18. Well, how would we represent that without a visual? Would Alexa just say, turn to page 18? No, that's not gonna happen. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, add some abstraction there to make it more delightful. Then what does Alexa say? And most importantly, what will the customer respond? How will they respond after Alexa says, do you wish to, turn to page 58 or turn to page 59 for the, in the case where a, the, the story branches. It is, after all, choose your own adventure. And um, each of the books advertises uh, at least 30 different endings. We had to build an interaction model. And I needed to specify the requirements for that interaction model. But we didn't even know what the interaction pattern would be. We didn't know how customers would respond to these navigation prompts that we had just written. And iterations were expensive. So every time we put a concept in front of a customer with some mocked ideas of what we thought they might say, if we were wrong and the experience broke, we wouldn't get the feedback that we needed to continue iterating. And if we didn't get enough customer feedback, each of those iteration cycles was costly in terms of engineering and time. So, well, this is where paper, paper prototyping comes in. This is a definition from concepttesting.com. Design teams, they draw sketches, low fidelity, uh, the, it, it's a bias towards cycle time. So what the heck did that look like? Well, that looked like me and the designer writing up some scripts. And then we went and did seven user tested seven user studies, which usually involved us patrolling the hallways of Amazon, looking for someone who would make eye contact and pulling them, asking them if they had an hour that we could use to do a user study. In the context of a user study, it'd be three people in a conference room, and I would pretend to be Alexa, and I would read off a script. So it would be me sitting here saying. He thanks you profusely. I slipped into the gully two days ago, he explains, and I was beginning to think I'd never get out. Do you go with Phaeton or set off to the Palace of the Sun? And the customer would reply as they would reply to the device. That was sort of how we instructed them. And then we'd just take note of what they said. And after the second or third paper prototyping session, which absolutely started as awkwardly as you would imagine. But what was interesting is that after the first couple of interactions, uh, the customer relaxed and just started responding as normal. We coalesced around a set of 80%, around an 80% solution. So for each of those types of interactions, uh, we identified 
about 80% of what customers, how customers would respond. And that enabled us, one, to tune the, the interaction, tune the questions, the prompts that we were giving uh, customers after each one of these was read. Uh, but it also allowed us to generate a, allowed me to write the requirements for the spread of customer input that we needed to handle. And uh, as a result, so here's a great little TechCrunch article from the uh, the launch of uh, the launch back in uh, uh, 2019. But th so at the end of the day, the value was I was able to write more precise requirements, which meant we spent less time iterating in QA because we found fewer bugs. Uh, we shipped overall a higher quality experience that handled a broader range of customer uh, input. Uh, and we shipped it faster. It was all because, you know, we were willing to walk around with with a paper script and just grab someone. There was no no fancy customer recruiting. I wasn't overly worried about segmentation and uh, the sample size. I just needed to go from total unknown to a closer known. The point is, paper prototype is low fidelity, shockingly low fidelity. It can be as simple as something you have written down. It can be on a uh, on a whiteboard. It can be a series of index cards. The point is to get customer feedback so that you can start at or, or for me, so that I can get really clear on what are those requirements exactly. What is P zero? What is P one? Uh, so that when I hand that off to the engineering team to be built, I have higher confidence that the requirements I'm giving are the actual requirements that need to be built. And it's nothing fancy. There are uh, very, uh, there are higher fidelity paper prototyping tools like Figma that you can use to create very interactive prototypes. But for my purposes, when the unknown was so broad, all I needed was uh, a, you know, a script and customers willing to pretend. And the real value of paper prototyping for me comes from the observations. So, excellent. We talked about paper prototyping, now we're moving on. Next situation, Starfinder. So in 2019, I'm pitching a new type of entertainment where the hypothesis is the, an audio book meets choose your own adventure. We, I had data that showed that there was a, a sizable number of customers who would enjoy more agency than an audiobook, but they didn't want something as actively engaging as a video game or, uh, or watching something visual. So our idea was the interactive audio adventure. We knew that we needed intellectual property. So my business development partner secured a meeting and I knew a prototype wouldn't convey that the concept adequately. We needed something a little bit higher fidelity. Well, that's where what I call the hackathon special comes in. Uh, so this is a single hero use case where everything's hard coded. If the wrong person sneezes, everything goes wrong. I jest, but the hackathon special is what is that absolute minimum hero use case that you can, you and maybe a developer can knock together in three to four hours that only works if you use it in a very specific way, but it, it works and it will convey the value. So let's talk about this, this hackathon. So I went back and my designer and I, uh, this is the, actually in the, uh, a screenshot from uh, the tool that we were using at the time to, to mock this out. We built a happy path in about four hours. It represented less than five minutes of gameplay because I knew that I would have a very limited time to showcase the functionality that we were proposing to this partner, uh, or to this collaborator. And, uh, but, it was key that we be able to showcase it on a device to get them to envision the concept. Uh, I shamelessly bribed a developer with Shake Shack, uh, both a burger uh, and a chocolate shake, to build uh, to build in 
dice rolling because a, a fundamental to the IP partner that we were pitching was this idea of you know rolling dice as part of a tabletop role playing game experience. So we had to have dice because that was an essential part of the experience. And then we spent a lot of time making sure that it functioned on a device only in the use cases that we were that, that that we needed. So we got there. This you can imagine. This is what I see as I'm walking into. I've driven out to uh, Redmond, Washington. I am walking into the uh, headquarters of uh, Paizo Inc., and they own the rights to many, many iconic tabletop role-playing game franchises. And this is the conference room that we're taking the meeting in and walking in, this is what I see. All of this history and intellectual property. And so we sit down, uh, my business development partner goes through the, the pitch deck and then I plug in a device and we go through the demo. Six weeks later, we sign the deal. Why? And, and I think, we may have gotten there eventually, but in that meeting, we played the demo and you could see the people, the folks around the table start to lean in as they started brainstorming with us. If they started to think about, wow, this could be something really cool and, and asking us questions like, well, could you build in this? Could you build in a dice rolling uh, mechanic that also took into account an armor class and uh, you know another modifier and well could it save your state over time and what about monetization options? It gave them enough of the functionality to be able to inspire further conversation and and for the folks around the table to see well this is a really interesting opportunity. This was the result. Uh, so this was a uh, article in Variety because uh, obviously we needed a, a, a voice cast, a stellar voice cast. So uh, we recruited 12 exceptional uh, narrators from uh, Audible as well as uh, Nathan Fillion. And we sh ended up shipping seven interactive audio experiences and uh, ended up proving the hypothesis that there were indeed uh, a number of uh, a, a business material a material from a business perspective, number of customers who are willing to pay a premium uh, for this type of uh, interactive adventure. And it the point of the 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 prototype in this case was that I needed something more than a paper prototype because going into a pitch meeting where I had a, a very limited amount of time where I'm trying to convey the value of the product, I, I couldn't ask them to uh, pretend that I was Alexa. I needed something better than that. Um, but the key was that it was focused on the happy path. If I had tried, if I had deviated from any of the uh, Past that we had that we presented in this five-minute adventure on rails, the experience would have broken. Um, but it communicated just enough of the concept to where everyone in the room could see the the potential value, which then led to additional conversations. Now, this was not sufficient to ship that that project. There was significant work that went into establishing the business opportunity, negotiations, uh, you know, establishing a schedule the, in the actual execution, but in the ideation phase where what was important was my ability to convey both the business opportunity, but also what could this be and, and what could it unlock? And that was what this hackathon special did. And I've used this multiple times in across different scenarios. So that's the hackathon special. Now let's talk about the video supercut. We're gonna talk about this digital unboxing experience. So it's it's late 2020 and you know, I'm, I'm working on uh, sort of this intersection of commerce and uh, digital goods. And I've got this observation of, you know, 
and it just hits me one day because I, I ordered this uh, a physical book. I was looking forward to it. And then I got the box and I opened it up and I was like, man, you know, I, I was really looking forward to that and realized there's really, there's no synonymous experience for that in, in when it comes to digital goods. And in fact, when I, you know, order a number of digital things, it would be kind of cool if there was a, some type of experience that was synonymous to the excitement that I get when I open up a physical box because I've ordered something that I'm looking forward to. So the hypothesis was that delightful digital unboxing experience could be a differentiator that might lead customers to purchase uh, one format over another or may uh, lead them to look for a badge uh, when making a purchase decision. And so on uh, the hero use case of pre-ordering a video game for the Xbox. And in this particular case, the reason for selecting Xbox is because Xbox has an existing Alexa skill, and there's there are people who use uh, Alexa to control their uh, Xbox. So that we had some uh, existing uh, tailwinds with that specific use case. That was our sort of our, our hero use case, our beachhead. Now, what I need to do is uh, kick off a discussion with Microsoft, and uh, in this case, that brought me to the video supercut. So in this case. Prototype doesn't have to work. Um, the and the primary tools, it's a you know cell phone the trim tool, and then you know whatever I need to sort of show what that functionality would look like. So in this case, a uh, monster load of Alexa devices, one with googly eyes. I'm not still not sure why that is, but um, that's what happens when you have children and working from home. The point with a video is that. In the case where the prototype you know, doesn't work end to end, I can compensate for that by using the trim tool and you know stitching different video clips together, and it still communicates the end to end experience. I'm going to come back to this though because uh, this has bitten me a couple of times. So um, I knew that I was going to go the video route as a demo to show uh, some of the the uh, folks from Microsoft as we went into this. Um, went to a business meeting with them. And here's the video that I showed them. Alexa, open shopping menu. The Mjolnir Exocet is now complete. Even though this technology will save humanity in the war to come, it all means nothing. <laughs> step inside. Halo Infinite will release on October 21st, 2021 and is available for pre-order. Because you've used the Xbox skill, I see you have an Xbox Series 10. The standard edition for the Xbox Series S is $59.99 and will be delivered digitally to your console on release day. Would you like to pre-order it? Yes. Fantastic. You have pre-ordered the standard edition of Halo Infinite for the Xbox Series S. It will be digitally delivered to your console on release day. I can send a notification to your devices and mobile phone when Halo Infinite is ready to play. Would you like that? Yeah. There was a problem with the requested skills response. <laughs> so... A couple of things to, to point out in here, you know, so so one is that uh, obviously it does not work end to end. In fact, you know, we saw the ridiculous latency at the very beginning. We saw it referred to uh, something called the Xbox Series 10, which has never been released to the best of my knowledge. Uh, that is because with Alexa's semantic understanding, it interprets an X after a regular word as the Roman numeral for 10. So instead, I needed to, uh, th there was a way I could have corrected that, but I didn't have time to do that. So it says Xbox Series 10. Uh, you also notice that it very clearly failed uh, when I said that, uh, when I responded, yes. However, in the demo, uh, I trimmed the latency at the front uh, from the video, and then I cut uh, right, before the, <laughs> right before the experience failed. I didn't correct any of the 
small errors like Xbox Series 10. It also then refers to the Xbox Series S at the end of the demo, obviously inconsistent. Um, we got shaky cam, the aspect ratio is not great, the lighting kind of sucks, but the point is that it we kick off with an artifact from uh, a trailer that I, you know, uh, borrowed for the sake of the, uh, you know, borrowed from video, extracted the audio for the purposes of, of creating the demo, and then it leverages some a, a an evocative background that's, you know, close enough, shows some interest, uh, and then it's 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 good enough to show what it might be and covers a couple of key elements of value that we thought were really important to convey. So <laughs> what was the result here? Well, it, you know, prototype, it wasn't perfect as, as we just talked about, but it did show sort of the, what could be and sort of where we were thinking. And we met with the partner teams and this was enough to get the jumpstart the conversation and to uh, move along towards a, an initial agreement. But guess what? Product ended up defunded after uh, we secured the initial agreement. About two months later, product was defunded, team pivoted. Key here is you can do all these things, get the right alignment, and you still won't win them all. So what's the, uh, the point kind of overall is we've talked about three techniques, the paper prototype, the hackathon special, the video supercut, this is an, an excellent example of, uh, this was recently last summer, a uh, paper prototype, or sorry, a hackathon special that I put together. I believe it was one day of effort that what we wanted to show was uh, what could be possible with a certain uh, books experience. You can see this is very clearly one of my test devices, but the point was just the picture with the uh, this information on it was enough to show to our partners and to get them to work with us on a longer roadmap. Let's talk a couple of caveats very briefly, which is the more risk, the higher fidelity. So thinking about risk as the amount of investment, the opportunity cost of that investment versus the uh, idea that I've that I'm bringing to the table. Do I need one engineer for three months, or do I need fifteen engineers for eighteen months? The difference in the information that I need to bring to show stakeholders and uh, offset that risk is is going to sort of drive the amount of fidelity that I need to have in my prototypes when I am interacting with stakeholders. So. Uh, you know, for example, in this, you know, sort of on, on the left here, what we see is um, this is using the using the tool Figma. This is from the UX Collective. If you want to uh, create mock-up videos using Figma, you can also create mock-up web prototypes. You know, all the way through uh, t TV television series, uh, they film a pilot episode. A pilot episode is a prototype of what the TV series uh, will be, who will star in it, what the setting will be, and uh, the results, the customer results from that pilot drive whether or not there's gonna be investment in the entire season or multiple seasons. So it's a, it, it becomes a factor as sort of a sliding scale of how much investment is required to make this idea uh, work, both you know, from an MLP perspective and then as it you know, sort of on a, on a broader vision. And there's an art to knowing when to be scrappy and when to spend money. When I was looking at that first meeting with the uh, Starfinder intellectual property um, holders, the uh, Paizo, I knew that a paper prototype uh, wasn't going to work because I, I, I needed them to quickly understand the, the type of interact, the interaction pattern of the device would provide content and a prompt, a player would respond. And that was the fundamental cycle of the interaction pattern. And that we could add 
different types of content. <clears throat> we could add different types of uh, features around the intelligence that we were able to build into that interaction pattern. But the fundamental interaction pattern was uh, content, prompt, response. Those three things in cycle. That's what I needed them to understand. And I was going to, it was going to take me too long to convey that with a paper prototype. And I needed them to hear it instead of have it be read to them. The difference there, I think, has, um, has not been something, it's a judgment call. It has ended up being a judgment call. And there are times where I've gotten it, uh, where it has worked and times where, uh, where it is not. Most recently, uh, I have had on a, the, the product that I'm currently working on, uh, there were a series of uh, stakeholder meetings where the prototype that we presented was the result of uh, six months of effort, a sizable investment using uh, agency work, as well as uh, leveraging uh, both a uh, two designers and an engineer, because that was the fidelity of the uh, the the investment we're asking for for from these stakeholders. It, we had to show them a, a prototype that was not a hero use case that was that showed a number of edge cases that was uh, exhaustive in the way that it handled. Uh, some of the common questions to come up. We needed them to envision what this product would look like over a multi-year arc, not just what would the MLP look like. Um, so that was that was a time where we spent much more time and a lot more resources in creating a prototype that would help them understand and uh, de-risk their investment. In general, what I have found is the precision of the information that I'm looking for uh, as, an, as an output of the exercise is the precision of the uh, input that I put in, which is to say, uh, a paper prototype, there's not much investment up front because the output that I'm looking for, I'm, I'm, it's still very uh, broad. I'm not looking for precise outputs with a paper prototype. The outcome of a meeting with stakeholders uh, is more precise, you know, can be more precise, especially the closer that you get to a meeting that will the, where the outcome will be a commitment or not. So therefore the precision of the input that I'm providing in terms of a, a prototype will then you know, go, go up or down. As generally speaking, what I've found is, as the way for me to meter between which of these types of techniques that I use, and, and they're not, like I said, they're not mutually exclusive, and I use them uh, sort of as I move, I, I may use all of them as I move through the initial process of product development. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, talking about these, these three different types of prototyping, how they, I've used them in different phases of uh, product development, how I've used them to communicate with stakeholders, and how I've used them to uh, reduce uncertainty in. Uh, as I've uh, written requirements and as we move through uh, the product development cycle. Feel free to reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn. Thank you again.